just waiting for the recording, and there we go. So this is the 26th of February, the IPFS All Hands. Um, today we don't have too many things on the agenda, uh, but before we begin, again, if you have things that you want to discuss, please add it to the agenda or the other uh, section that appears here, help content. Uh, anyways, so let's begin. The first thing we're going to talk about, which is from me, Victor, uh, is that in case you haven't noticed, the sprint spot is broken. I tried to recover it last week, but it seemed to not be as easy as I thought. It runs on a, on a server together with a lot of other things and uh, need to move it to a separate thing and make sure everything is working fine. So I haven't actually had time through that yet. I hope I will fix this in the middle of this week. Uh, so in the meantime, if you see something weird, please let me know. And that's it. And then the second point on the agenda is from uh, Lido about better release channel for IPFS Companion. Take it away. Yeah, so by the way, let's try if my screen sharing uh, is fixed. <laughs> so I quickly... Make sure. Oh gosh, don't tell me that does not work. I do see lines on the screen. How about now? Is it like working or not? Now there seems to be no share, shared screen at all. <laughs> all right, then. Uh, then I'll just uh, quickly go over. Uh, the link I've put into the uh, meeting notes. We have a new uh, release of uh, IPFS uh, browser extension called Companion. And what's interesting about this release uh, is that, first of all, we have a working beta channel for anyone who wants to test the latest, uh, the greatest features and do not want to manually install every new uh, developer beta version we release. So uh, if you install uh, from beta channel, we have channels for Firefox and Chrome currently, you will be automatically updated to the next hand-picked uh, beta release. And you don't need to do anything. Just keep in mind that this release is a separate extension it has a separate extension id so all settings from the stable release channel will be separate and beta will have own a namespace for all settings so that uh, if anything breaks in beta you can always switch back to the stable release channel and in this latest beta that we released today are two nice uh, and very uh, like <laughs> long awaited features first of all is uh, initial stab at embedding js ipfs and uh, it works in chrome it works in firefox for uploads it's based on the brave uh, work uh, done by Oli and uh, alan and uh, we cannot uh, download uh, using embedded node yet, so we use a public gateway for downloads, but if you want to quickly share a file with your friends, you can just grab the latest beta. Uh, you can even send a link to this latest beta to your friend, uh, and uh, there's no need for external daemon if you want to quickly upload something, like an ephemeral uh, file share. And a second, uh, second feature, the, uh, released along uh, in this uh, beta is window.ipfs feature, which is IPFS API proxy, which exposes IPFS API of your node. That node can be external node, or it can be this embedded node that you are running inside of your browser, and you can expose access to IPFS API to websites. It's mostly like, uh, Initial uh, proof of concept for developers. Uh, we have an initial document that I've shared last week. Uh, this is like a 
final polished version that provides a scope based access control so that if you have an application served uh, from the public gateway or from any other gateway uh, those applications will have a separate uh, access controls uh, so the control will be more uh, strict than the regular origin and i think that's all from my end just uh, let us know if you have any uh, issues with those beta versions uh, those betas are for like uh, dog fooding we want to test it on different uh, browsers uh, on different ar architectures like we had a user uh, interface problems on mac that i was not able to catch because i'm not using mac i'm using linux so uh, even if you want to switch to the beta that would be very helpful and we really really try to keep betas uh, stable so that it won't break your uh, workflow daily workflow so uh, i think that's all from my end just let us know what you think yeah matt do you have um i'm looking at the release notes this is exciting do you have basically it would be really cool to be able to install this beta and then have a couple recommended sites or apps or things i could load to just see how it works with all this permission stuff and see it see it see that app request permissions and things do you have just like a list of ones like we, uh, we it's uh, the answer is, uh, <laughs> I have two answers to that. First answer is that we started providing examples in this document uh, uh, about uh, window IPFS. So far we have only the basic uh, code example. Uh, what we will do, there is a separate uh, effort to provide a landing page after new user installs extension. Uh, there will be a landing page with uh, information about distributed uh, web. And there will probably be a, a reference to building applications that make use of window IPFS object. It's also possible that we will provide a link to that uh, documentation from the preferences screen when user can ena uh, enable disable this, uh, this feature. That's, that will probably uh, happen in next beta right now we don't have any like solid example we want to uh, add code that detects already pre-existing window ipfs object to peer pad uh, like a proof of concept uh, and uh, like just to see how it works so that's on our roadmap but not yet uh, i think b5 <laughs> Yeah, you. I think you raised your hand before. Oh, sorry. I was just giving you a thumbs up. All like, oh, oh, right. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We have any other questions? All right. Let's move on then. Uh, the next update we have is from David about webinars. Cool. Thank you. So, as some of you may know, last week. We have a quick test run on the Zoom webinar feature. And by the way, thank you so much, Jay, Lars, and Dimitri for joining. And we created a document with notes, which I would like to share with you today so that we go through what we learned. So can everyone see my Firefox window? All good. And so, yeah, like we created an issue, like we invited everyone to sign up, um, and then we scheduled a webinar and we developed a little script with the things that we wanted to test. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to test was if we, um, if a, a non-host appeared sooner or if a host uh, was late, would um, a, just a participant be able to, to start the webinar? And what we learned is no, like until like in Zoom meetings, if you schedule a meeting, like anyone uh, can open that link and start the call. But for Zoom webinars, you really need to have the host. And so from that, like the next question was like, what, how can we have multiple hosts? Um, we discovered that only the people with uh, protocol.ai domain, because our Zoom account is on protocol.ai domain, we could create one for IPFS.io. That's not a problem. But only people with those domains could actually become hosts of the webinar. And so here's like me trying to add Jay on his email and it's, it doesn't work. This means that like 
we could like we could have uh sorry just give me a second Sorry, uh, I was getting distracted by some uh, organization that's happening here. Um, so, so yeah, like we could add multiple people as hosts, um, but then it means like we would always have to make sure that like at least one host, like one person with an ad IPFS domain, would was uh, prepared to be present. Otherwise, the call would not start. Um, one of the things that I discovered by chance was if you create a call, if you create a webinar, and if you, or if you are assigned as a host, you cannot have other meetings. So for example, we manage uh, that like, all the people here um, have an IPFS.io account and they are all assigned as hosts for that hour, for that webinar. Uh, if they ask to have another call uh, using Zoom, Zoom would block them from opening another session because it will say that like their account is already being used to have that webinar running. By the way, if, if, uh, if you have any questions or if you have any, any other, um, if I'm not being clear enough on, on what would the experiment and the conclusions, let me know. Um, the, the next thing that we want to try, okay, like even if we went through the hurdles of like giving everyone IPFS.io accounts and like uh, enabling people to, um, to open open the webinar, even if like the the regular uh, the regulars are not here to open, uh, how could we set up the live stream? And and setting up the live stream is actually very simple. Uh, like after you um, enable it on the on the dashboard for Zoom, like a simple host can just like click on the more button and select which live streaming service to use, like YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and so on. However, uh, there is one more, more catch there, which is if we want to use YouTube as our platform for live streaming, then the person that's going to click that live stream has to be logged in with the YouTube IPFS account. So after you log in with IPFS.io, you also have to log in and you have to be a manager of the YouTube channel that we have on uh, YouTube. So that's like double permission thing. Like, so what like, makes sense? Like we would have to like um, have both of those things set up for everyone. And, and yeah, and so like this is the message of like a person that is on the host sees before a host joins. Uh, ah, there's another thing, um, like people in webinars are uh, defaulted to participants, to attendees, and attendees can only uh, ask questions to chat. Uh, a host can ask to manually uh, promote everyone to a panelist. And once they get promoted to a panelist, like then we have a similar experience that we have here, like uh, a gallery review, and like everyone can, can see everyone and everyone can speak. But it, it is another manual step. Like if the host doesn't notice that someone joins the call and they just stay as an attendee, they might, well, decide to leave because they might think that they, there's something wrong with Zoom, but it's just like the host has to be explicit and like promote someone to be a panelist. And, and yeah, I think this is all the learnings uh, from that test session. Pretty much the conclusion, as you might have noticed, is like we didn't get too much excited. Like seems that like it adds more hurdles than benefits. Although like having live stream would be really, really nice, but like the fact that we would have to set up accounts for everyone so that everyone could open the session and that only the people that have a um, manager role on the YouTube account can actually do the live stream. Um, like, and then again, the experience, the fact that like we now have to promote everyone to a panelist and like when people join, they are just an attendee, like just makes, changes the, the vibe from this call. Like it's not that thing where someone joins and everyone says hello and so on. Uh, Lars, Lars is not here. Uh, Jay or Dimitri, do you want to add something? Anything in there, Miss? Jay, go for it. Well, I, I think that the test pointed out some really key items that are points of friction, as you highlighted, David. And, you know, personally, I, I think it'd be really cool to try to create something out of the IPFS uh, platform that might uh, 
reduce the friction points. Um, I know that's an ambitious undertaking, but uh, something I'd, I'd really, really be interested in working on or with other folks. So that's my two cents. Thank you. A any questions, uh, Matt? i just point out that when we were streaming it to YouTube, uh, only Victor and um, Kuba were actually even able to do it. So we already had, so we had the limitation of there were only two people who were capable of doing the setup and they were responsible for doing that setup. And then it just, the overhead of that setup ended up becoming so unwieldy that they stopped doing it. Whereas this is just like be logged into two accounts and be on the call. So it's, it works then to have just two people who could do that setup. I guess it, it changes the flow of like, as people arrive, you have the, um, leveling people up from being an attendee to a, to a panelist. Um, so, but then I guess I partially retract saying it's the same. Uh, Johnny. Yeah. Have you checked out the, uh, the API? I put the link in the, I actually am looking at it right now for, you can have an authentication and create webinars. I'm looking actually how there, I thought there was a way to automatically sling it to YouTube. And so okay. there is like it is automatic as in you click a button and then starts live stream, but asks you to log in into your Google account, which then right. asks the manager of the IPFS YouTube channel. Right. I think if you just, uh, yeah, maybe not. All right. I, I thought there was a, a hook to authenticate and get a bearer token for YouTube and include that. But I guess that doesn't, not going to work for a that, that was, a, I think I, I know what you're talking about. Like there was a, definitely a service a long time ago. Like there was a time that like Hangouts also did live streaming directly to YouTube and then they removed that feature from Hangouts and then you had to have like a, a token from YouTube to enable you to do the live stream. But then it was like a two, two step setup where you like create a live stream, schedule the live stream on YouTube, grab the token and then paste it on the service that you wanted to live stream to. Yeah. Um, and so what Zoom does for you is just like it get, like uses the YouTube API to create that session and right. grab the token and use it directly. Uh, but again, it still requires authentication. But for my, my YouTube account, I actually I have a static endpoint that actually is like my live stream. So if I actually go um, Zoom to my live stream, it's the same URL that I'm hitting all the time that actually suddenly Johnny Crunch is, is live. And... Um, so I think uh, there is also a plugin for Slack. I don't, know, I don't really like Slack, but you actually can link and have your Slack and actually just type Zoom and actually creates an automatic uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think what you are proposing was similar to what we were doing with OBS, so open broadcasts. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so OBS, like we always add the, like the static token from YouTube. And, right. and like we would just like click go live and it would record the Zoom window and the audio coming from here to stream to YouTube. Um, yeah, like to, to, to your point, Matt, to your feedback, Matt, um, we could actually just like have a special like um, Zoom account and a, a special uh, Gmail slash Google Apps account that we are more comfortable ending to people uh, instead of like having to like give accounts to everyone and have to manage all of that right now. Like we kind of like do this anyway, because we have to log in with our ops zoom account to, to then record. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, I, I, I think we, we can try to work it out. Uh, and I document this very well. So it's very clear to everyone. What are the steps? Um, yeah, like, I'm not sure if that is better than just having a machine somewhere with OBS installed and, and just like that knows how to, to screen capture the zoom window and do the live stream, um, automatically. Maybe there is an issue somewhere on GitHub where we can point people to to continue to find a solution to this. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. So like we can use the same issue, issues 571 on IPFS PM. Uh, it was the issue created for the test, but now we can, can, we can use it to continue the conversation. Can you add that to the notes? Yeah. Yeah, just, just copy paste it. Okay. Do we have any other questions regarding the webinars that people want to speak about before we move on? All right. Let's continue to a point that was just added. Welcome new visitors. Yeah, that's, I added that. I noticed that there's actually like three or four or five new, new faces on. So if you're new and you'd like to say hello, um, go ahead and, and say hello and maybe tell us, tell us how you, especially how you learned about this call, because we're trying to make it more visible. OK, I'll go first. Um, Zane. Uh, been building like infrastructure for the past decade and then uh, was sort of uh, on the fringes of like um, sort of distributed data types and like um, content addressable data. So I was just trolling the internet, stumbled across IPFS uh, and that was a really cool project. Uh, so then I wanted to look for a way to sort of get involved. Uh, I like scanned across the like sort of GitHub issues and I was like, oh, what's this? There's a, like a dev call. So then I ended up clicking on community and then couldn't find the uh, actual link for like a couple weeks. Because <laughs> I didn't realize that I needed to like look at the calendar entry in order to like find that. And then I would be like, oh, I missed it this week. Oh, I missed it this week. Uh, so actually what would be really helpful is like, if the IRC bot just like spammed out the link before, I think you mentioned that on IRC like not too long ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically digging around through the Git issues, I like stumbled across this and then like the actual like Zoom link, that's what it was missing. Yeah. Great, thanks. And where in the world are you? Uh, I'm in Oakland actually. San Francisco, basically. Cool. <laughs> I used to manually spam out the, the link onto, onto IRC every week, and I just stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Any of the other newcomers want to say hello? Hey, um, Raghav. I don't know if you can, can you guys hear me? Yep. Cool. Um, I guess I've talked to David, uh, maybe you as well, uh, over email. Uh, I work at Keep Fold Labs in uh, San Francisco uh, with Matt Luongo and co. And uh, just a you know fan of Lib P2P, been reading the code and uh, trying to understand all the work that y'all have done and to make use of it. And uh, found out about this call through IRC, which I am uh, doing a terrible job of keeping up with. Cool, welcome. Anyone else want to say hello? Yeah, hey, I'll say hello. I'm, I'm Lex Sheehan. I'm actually working with uh, Raghav, and uh, I heard about this uh, through Raghav, and I've got uh, an IRC chat client up. I have it keep it, uh, keep it running all the time just so it'll log all the images. Um, uh, I'm actually in Atlanta, um, but, uh, yeah, we're working with uh, some of this IP, IPFS technology. Cool. Welcome. Anyone else? All right, and then back to the regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, so now we have Jared talking about restructuring these calls that all happen. So I put a new issue in the PM issues list 573, uh, just put it in chat. It's already in the notes. Um, and I actually finished it before the last call. So I put that in the notes for last time. So it's also there. Uh, so that proposal is actually a, not to change this call, but to create a new call, uh, especially to welcome newcomers and discuss uh, new items um, or open items on issues or on the discourse site. And there's one comment there so far, 
Um, I'm not sure if there's any uh, core members that have commented on it yet or looked at it yet. And uh, I don't have permission, I don't think, to add any of this. So uh, I'm really dependent on core members to, um, if we're going to implement a new call, uh, actually have anything happen with that. All right, so you sounds like you need someone to jump in and help. Victor, are you available to help with this? With just like this setting up? Uh, I do need to leave uh, today, but I can help any other day. Cool. Later in the week as well. Okay. Yeah, then I can I can help out. A uh, couple of quick notes. Um, kind of disappointed to hear David's evaluation of the Zoom webinar. Um, maybe that could be done via a uh, screen cap on a separate machine, uh, broadcasting a YouTube or even Facebook Live or Twitch or something. And then um, I, I think we need some way for people to know that they can come on to the call. Uh, somewhat anonymously. Uh, so if you see the gallery view right now, there's several names without pictures or anything. Uh, so uh, the splash page item for the all hands call would apply to this new call as well. And that's a good place where we could explain how people could come on pseudo anonymous anonymously and um, sort of avoid newcomer embarrassment. All right. Do we have any questions regarding this? I'm going to chime in on the GitHub issue. I'm wondering about timing. I th do people, well, I guess I'll just, proposing another call for Friday means like another day's disruption by calls like this, as opposed to just doing, put adding a call that's back to back with this one. Um, so that like people who've set aside time to be on these calls can just sort of allocate an hour instead of 30 minutes or an hour and a half instead of, um, instead of an hour would be, at least for my schedule, more workable. Um, so, and I, I, I know that for other people it's the same. So I'll, I'll chime in on the GitHub issue. That's, we can sort out that on the issue. Also, 8 a.m. on uh, Fridays is a bit of a bad time for a lot of people. Just say that. Yeah, so let's, oh. let's, let's hammer out the timing on the, on the GitHub issue. We don't need to discuss it on here. Cool, and the link is in the, in the notes if you're interested in leaving your feedback there. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item is from Steven about the help wanted section. Uh, so uh, it can be a bit difficult to get people to help out with various things in IPFS because often we don't know how loaded people are. So you kind of ping random people and hope you don't overload them. And it would just be nice to have a way to like, just display all the open problems and all, or all the things we need worked on and allow people to sort of volunteer and say, hey, I have time, or hey, I'm interested in working that, on that. So would people here be interested in adding a help wanted section to this call? Just a short, like, here are some the quick issues I need someone to tackle. Anyone have free time to tackle these? Does that sound reasonable to people? Uh, I'll take the... Like, yeah, I just have my hand like waiting. Should, should I say? Should I go? Yeah. Um, go I think that's great. Like it's always like I have received very positive feedback from using this call in the past, as in like, oh, there's like these little things that like are great for first newcomers. Um, it does require a lot of work though, because it means like every week you or someone else from the Go IPFS team needs to prepare a list and needs to make sure that they are present here to describe what are those issues. Mm -hmm. And also like spends everyone's time on listening what those issues are. Mm -hmm. And so what the Just IPFS people land uh, project 
um, is doing right now is yeah, using the waffle board in combination with a help pointed level and like three difficulties. So easy, moderate, and hard. Um, and there was like a first call uh, for the JSIPFS core dev team that explain how to like how to see those labels like what do they mean like help wanted means like anyone from the community even without like a lot of experience should be able to like jump in and contribute difficulty easy typically means like from our perspective again human error but like from our perspective like less than four hours so something that you can do in the morning like in the evening something like that um and and typically the those issues are really this like self-explanatory so that like a contributor could just like, go into the issue and grab all the information that they need to solve it and, and uh, if you adopt that strategy i think it's good for both implementations because then it's like a canonical way to like find work okay uh and also like saves you time because then people you can just point people to the waffle board and they can filter for the thing that this is not necessarily for just for new users or new contributors mostly for actually for who have been contributing for a while, mm. who may have extra time oh. and tackle a high priority issue. Mm -hmm. so. and, and so for that, we have another set of levels, which is the priority from P0 to P4, mm -hmm. right? So for example, in every weekly dev call, like one of the things, if we have time after all the updates, uh, is to just open up a board and like filter by the P0s and P1s mm -hmm. and see what are the things that are super critical and right now no one's like paying attention to. Um, yeah, we do that, but it doesn't mean people must pay attention to them either. <laughs> So the, the, the point here is to serve with some, if you think it doesn't fit this call, you can put it somewhere else. I think it's good. I'm just saying that like be prepared because uh, you might need some some way to scale that up. Okay, <laughs> this is mostly just like the burning things are starting getting done. Yes, Matt? So it sounds like there's just, there were two things in your request and David's responding to one of them. One is to have a way to surface the things where help is needed mm -hmm. and David saying, in order to do that, you should be grooming the GitHub issues and make sure that the GitHub issues are sufficiently groomed and surfaced in something like a like a waffle board so that people can see all of that together. So mm -hmm. it's not so much about a time. To, to have all of that stuff surface is about grooming the board, not about having a time. What you're also requesting is that, hey, let's have a time in this call where people can say, I especially need, synchronously, I need help with X. Can yeah. someone help me with X? And that, that sounds fine to me. And it also connects with the suggestion that we could do a um, sort of ask me anything mm -hmm. structure in these calls. And that's part of what Jared's been working on. So we could do, like there's, I am, per, I am actively working on some code and I need some help. And then there's also like, I need to get my head around, I'm, I'm a newbie and I don't understand this API function. And those both, I think, can kind of coexist. Yeah, this, this sector is mostly just like, this really does need to get done. Does anyone have time to work on it? In a, like in something that's more obvious and uh, explicit than simply like listing it on some waffle board somewhere where people may or may not pick it up. Okay. Yeah. It seems like you already have a couple of issues to share today. So I'll, I can share them. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, currently, go IPFS. We like two. We have two things that really kind of need to get done, but no one has time for them. Uh, one is switching GoDoTP to new uh, MDNS library. Um, currently, this is causing a lot of, well, our, our current Go, or, uh, MDNS library is very buggy uh, and has some nasty race conditions that may be causing some unsafe, undefined behavior. Uh, so if anyone is interested and anyone has time, uh, would anyone be interested in switching GoIPFS to use a new MDNS library? Well, okay. If you are interested, you can go to the issue uh, mm -hmm. and take a look at it. Um, I understand people don't have time. Uh, the second issue is uh, we're trying to push out a release, but we still have a lot of small bugs in the commands library that we just uh, finished merging. Um, and this is kind of blocking the release. So if people want to sort of tackle small, but somewhat hairy and painful to debug issues, uh, that's the second issue. There are three issues listed there. There are more on the issue tracker. So, mm -hmm. and I guess the reward is a new YPFS release that everyone wants? Yes. <laughs> yes, the, yeah, the, the MDNS library can technically wait, it'd be nice. The GoFS commands things are kind of pressing. So if you have time, uh, if you want to look into it, that'd be great. Very cool. Thank you very much. We have any questions regarding this? Seems to be pretty clear. 
basically, if you want to do go, go to the issue tracker, fix some bugs. All right, moving on. Uh, the next point in our agenda is about meetup orgs disappearing. So today I received that email, and I was not alone, that the IPFS bot user has stepped down and there is no replacement. So there seems to be at least three meetup groups affected. I am not sure who is managing the meetup stuff. Uh, I do believe David is managing at least one of them. Go for it. Yeah, so this is kind of like a news to me. I need to check what happened. Uh, I did a lot of this work in the beginning. Essentially, I have in my personal account a bunch of IPFS meetups, and then I used the IPFS bot account to create a bunch of other meetups because there is a limit three per account. Um, and so I don't know what happened to the IPFS bot account. It seems like someone just closed that account uh, for some reason. Uh, let's check what happened there. But what we might need to do super soon, and like it has happened to me in the past, that meetup.com, like when they say they are going to close something, they actually delete it from the database. Like there was a meetup that we had for Portland and, and we, like I had to step down to create another meetup because of the limitation and like they deleted it. They didn't send me an email. And then when I tried to recover, like everything was gone. Um, like the attendees list, like the, the slides, the photos, etc. So, so we might need to, yeah, we need to act before March 8th. Um, I am especially busy this week. Um, and so I'm afraid that I might fail to pay enough attention to understand what's going on here. So if someone would like to volunteer to figure out, especially someone that has access to these accounts, um, would like to volunteer to figure out this with me, it would be great. All right, I can also try to ping people or just try to do it myself. Just, just have in mind that meetup.com will definitely delete things. Jay? Yeah, I'll I'll work with you on that to get uh, those cool. reestablished. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and thank you uh, for uh, Victor for or Jay for bringing this up. Some reason for some reason I didn't receive this email. All right. Then we can move on. And then we have the last agenda item. It is actually a demo about IPLD and GraphQL. So let's see if Paul, I think, is here. Yep, I'm here. Everybody uh, right. can hear me. Uh, okay, I'm going to share my screen um, and give you a quick, quick background. I, I talked a little bit about what we're working on a few meetings ago. Um, <clears throat> but for those who don't know, we're, we're building a uh, marketplace for the buying and selling of what we're calling carbon removal credits or carbon removal claims, basically making it easier for people to pay other people to remove carbon from the atmosphere and eventually reverse climate change. And we're backing all this on top of uh, the Ethereum blockchain and looking at IPFS as a mechanism for storing or keeping track of the data that proves a certain amount of carbon was removed. So um, there's a link to a GitHub issue uh, in the notes, which spells out our whole use case if you're interested in. Um, but we've got just a quick demo here to showcase how it works. So here I'm showing you our internal pay, our internal faucet essentially for minting these uh, CRC assets, which are just tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and right now I can just type in, you know, some data that proves uh, carbon was removed. Um, eventually this will come in from APIs or other uh, sources that are very strongly verified, um, either by humans or, or cryptography or a combination of the two. Um, but I will mint one CRC, which represents uh, one ton of CO2 removed. And so, this does two things. One is it adds uh, some data onto um, into IPFS, and it uh, 
also creates a new transaction in the Ethereum blockchain. Inside of that transaction is uh, the CID for the data that we stored in IPFS. Um, so here we can see the latest CRC number 27 that I just minted. Um, I don't know if I'll maybe I'll expand this since it might be hard to see. Uh, here's the data that I just typed in. We've got, we're using um, linked data. So we have crater data, which points to another IPFS node. Um, and then we have this GraphQL query, which will traverse through these IPLD nodes um, based on a schema that we have come up with. Um, so in the top portion, creator data is actually just uh, a link. And actually, if I go into um, here, Um, I can grab that creator data and it spells out the type of data that it is, which is used to figure out what schema it follows. Um, or I can grab uh, the whole node here. Um, and it's just back that same thing. Or I can just say, give me creator data. Name. Um, so right now we are storing this data in um, Google Cloud Data Store. And when we actually make these GraphQL queries, we're not talking directly to IPFS, but we're instead talking to um, our data store. And our data store, all it does is it keys by CID, and then the data is the raw um, bag CBOR encoded data. Um, but here's an example of what the uh, query looks like. So I can just say, just says CRC data, but really it will take any kind of CID. Um, and we can ask for the IPLD node in particular. And based on the exact type of data that is stored in that node, uh, we can query for various things. So if I grab this same CID over here and query for it through GraphQL, um, it'll give me the, the latest information here. Um, anyways, that's the demo. I think what we'd like to see uh, happen with IPFS and IPLD is uh, more kind of turnkey support for this type of querying um, so that we can basically remove ourselves as a central point for both the storage of the data and the querying of that data. Um, and there's a, in that IPFS issue, some discussion about how we see that happening. Yes, questions? Right. Maybe we could uh, stop the screen sharing before moving on to questions so we can see everyone. Oh, yeah. Stop share. There we go. Let's go with Matt first, and then we have Johnny. So just to clarify, you're writing the data as IPLD into a local IPFS node, and then you're also indexing it into Google's graph query service so that you can get the graph query behaviors more dynamically. Is that right? Uh, a couple of things. One, so that um, we have more permanent storage. So we're, instead of just having this, right now it just uh, mirrored that data into my local IPFS daemon. Um, but if I shut down my IPFS daemon, I still want to get that data back. Or, or if I, my IPFS daemon disappears. So, so that part we're storing from Cloud Data Store. Any other yeah, I just uh, consider using at context, similar to JSON LD for your schema. And uh, then, then actually that schema could also just be a JSON object stored as IPLD. That's what I do. Oh, okay, that's a good suggestion. Cool. We have some, some more questions. Any other last words from Paul? It's great to see people using IPLD in all these different ways. <laughs> Very nice indeed. Okay, then I think that is about it. 
for today's all hand, unless someone has some final words before we leave. Otherwise, I think that's it. Thank you everyone for taking the time to, to appear and we can stop the recording now. Thank you.